Well, good morning. good morning. My name is Todd Malone, and it is a joy to be with you, be with you here this morning. I, um, I love that last hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will go strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Uh, it is a profound truth that the more we focus on Jesus and the more that we know Jesus, the more that we walk with Jesus, the more that that radically changes what we think is important. Um, I want to take a few seconds this morning and um, do a public service announcement, so to speak. Um, we just need to make you aware of the finances of the church, if you have not noticed uh, in the bulletin, and sometimes it's not always clear. But the fact is that our giving has been below expenses really for several years, but we have had a very generous reserve fund that has uh, made that up. Year after year, uh, our church actually spends well below budgeted expenses. Um, any capital work that you see done is only done because of um, repair or replacement. And in fact, about a year ago, um, we made a round of cuts to help bring down those expenses even further, and we continue to operate below budgeted expenses. But the fact is, by the end of this year, that reserve fund is going to end. It will be, it will be no more. So we're going to communicate with you more in the coming weeks. Um, here's what we need from you right now. The most important thing that we need from you is prayer. It is absolutely true that God gives us the resources that we need to do the ministry that he calls us to do. And so we need wisdom and insight for what that looks like. Um, and then honestly, if you're part of the FBC family and you have not considered supporting FBC financially, I think this would be a good time for you to prayerfully consider doing that as well. Um, it is part of being a part of the family that worships together and cares for one another. So, as I said, we trust and know that the Lord gives us the resources we need to do the work he has called us to do. Uh, but it's also important to communicate openly and clearly just where we're at and to some degree the trajectory that we've been on for a while. So, okay. Who here has someone in their life that loves to take things apart for no apparent good reason? No. I know someone who, um, actually, who here is that person? <laughs> Excellent, yes. I know someone who, um, so some time ago, came home from work, and his roommate had taken not my friends, but the roommate's computer apart and had it just scattered all over the table. The motherboard was out, the hard drive was out, there were chips just everywhere on the table. And this roommate was just incredibly excited. I mean, it's like, here's the hard drive, look at the motherboard, here's the fan, and look at all these chips, and he's saying, wow, look at this, look what this does, isn't this interesting? And my friend was thinking, what are you doing? It was working. Every dad in this room knows exactly what that feels like. Because at some point along the way towards marriage, they went on a date to see a movie. They pulled into the parking lot and their date said, we need to talk about where this relationship is headed. Are we friends? Are we dating? Where are we going here? I need us to define the relationship. And I can promise you the first thing that goes through a guy's head at that moment is, what are you doing? It's working. <laughs> the second thing that goes through the guy's head is, well, maybe we'll make it to the nine o'clock movie. <laughs> and then you realize, no, no, you won't catch the nine o'clock movie. 
And instead of seeing Godzilla, you spend the evening looking at motherboards and chips of the relationship. See, the words define the relationship strike terror in the heart of many men everywhere because they think everything is working fine. Why do we need to analyze it? And I suspect all of our dates gave us some version of the same answer. If they're going to be emotionally invested in the relationship, they need to know where it's going and what they can expect. And you know what? They're right. You didn't hear that from me. The men actually have the same need, but the fact is we would much rather watch Godzilla. And guess what? We all have the same need when it comes to our relationships with one another. When it comes to our relationships with the church, we would prefer to just say everything's working and keep going. But if we do that, we end up missing that the relationships within the church are supposed to be going somewhere. And there are legitimate expectations to have within the church. And if we make that mistake, then people start thinking that the church is built on things like pastors and programs and a show on Sunday morning. People think that the church is built on certain traditions or styles or denominational doctrines. And a church that's built on things like that might have a lot of people and it might do a lot of cool things. But it is absolutely failing at its core mission. This series is designed to keep us from becoming a church that look good, looks good on the outside, but is inwardly decaying. Our theme this year is based on John 13, 35. The way people will know that we are followers of Jesus is through our relationships with one another. If our relationships are characterized by division and gossip and backbiting and jealousy, why would anyone think that Jesus has anything to offer us. The world to see churches functioning the way they are supposed to. And honestly, every Christian needs to be in a church that is functioning the way that it is supposed to. This week, we start at the very beginning. We're starting in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, Jesus talks about building the church. Although I think he's talking about the universal church, which means all Christians everywhere in all of history, everything that he says applies equally to the local church, like FBC. So in this passage, what we're going to see is that there is a common misunderstanding of who Jesus is that we still find in our culture today. We still find in churches everywhere today. And then we see a correct understanding of who Jesus is. And finally, this correct understanding becomes the basis on which Jesus builds a healthy church. The first two verses, verses 13 and 14, show us how Jesus is misunderstood. See, specifically, Jesus is misunderstood as a guide to the good news. Jesus starts the conversation by asking a question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Son of Man was Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself. And there's, there's a lot of richness behind the term. Uh, there's connection with Old Testament passages about the Messiah. But for today, this passage, what we need to understand is that Jesus' question basically comes down to this. What is the word on the street of who I am? When people are sitting down, drinking a Dr. Pepper and talking about who I am, what are they saying? And in verse 14, the disciples answer the question. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. You see, some people thought that Jesus was the return of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was, was a prophet that had been alive during their lifetime. He was someone that did not hesitate to call sin, sin, even to people who are politically powerful. So it might be like people today saying that Billy Graham had come back to life. Elijah and Jeremiah are interesting choices. You see, in Jesus' day, many people believed that Elijah and Jeremiah would come back to life just before Messiah would come and would lead his people to freedom. So it might be like thinking that Abraham Lincoln had come back to life. Everyone listed in verse 14 
was someone who pointed other people to the good news. They called sin, sin. They called for repentance. And then they would show people what they had to do to find forgiveness and salvation. And it sounds like a really positive way to talk about Jesus. But if that's who you think Jesus is, then you have a profound misunderstanding of Jesus. Jesus is not someone who just points people to the good news. You see, if Jesus were only a prophet, if Jesus were only someone who pointed people to the good news, he would be one of history's greatest teachers, preachers, and examples to follow. If Jesus were just a prophet, his mission would be to warn you about sin and point you in the direction of how to live. But here's what Jesus would not do. If that is your picture of Jesus, he would not be able to save you. He would not be able to empower you to live righteously. He would just give you a list of do's and don'ts and tell you to go work hard. And that is exactly how a lot of people in churches today see Jesus. I had lunch with someone this past week who... Um, told me about a situation that he is in where he is talking to a number of people who are on staff in leadership at a couple of other churches in town. And what he is encountering is fundamentally the belief that Jesus keeps you from going to hell. That's a good thing. But beyond that, it's all about you working hard. How much God loves you and how he treats you depends totally on how hard you work for him. Basically, they think Jesus is someone who points out for the Christian what they do wrong, is an example of what should be done right, and then gets angry and disappointed in you when you don't follow his example. And here's the thing. That is not Jesus. Our culture reduces Jesus to someone who tells you what to do wrong, or tells you what is wrong, shows you what to do right, and then shakes his head at you when you fail. And since Jesus has the power to save you, since Jesus has the power to save you from hell, that's enough. But he doesn't do anything to change you as a Christian. He just judges you. If that is your view of who Jesus is, you live in fear, frustration, and failure. You will know, you may not admit it to yourself and certainly not to others, but you will know that living like Jesus is impossible for you. So you constantly feel like a failure. You will be deeply frustrated that you continue to struggle with sin. And since you think Jesus is shaking his head in anger and disappointment over your struggle, you will live in constant fear of what he's going to do next to you. But that's not who Jesus is. The people thought... They gave Jesus a compliment by calling him one of the great prophets. In fact, they were not even close to being right. The right answer comes from Peter. And in verses 15 and 16, Jesus is revealed not as the pointer to good news, but as the good news itself. Verse 15, Jesus asked the same question that he asked in 13. Wording's changed a little bit, but it's really the same thing. But now... He wants to know not what the people think, but what the disciples think. You could literally translate this, what about you? What do you think? And Jesus puts the disciples on the spot. What do they, the men who have been with him every single day, believe about who Jesus is? Peter answers the question in verse 16, and he, in one sentence, summarizes the gospel, the good news of Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The word Christ is a Greek word. It's a way of translating the Hebrew word Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. It was a way of saying that Jesus was sent from God to do God's will in a very special way. The Jews had been waiting for the coming of Messiah. They were waiting for someone who had come to save them and free them from political oppression. And Jesus did come to save. 
but not in the way they thought. He came to save them by providing forgiveness for their sin. When Jesus calls Peter the Christ, he is focusing, he is affirming that Jesus is the Savior. When Jesus calls Peter son of the living God, he is highlighting the unique, intimate relationship that Jesus has with God the Father. The phrase literally has the idea that Jesus has all the qualities of God. So here's the power of what Peter has said in one short sentence. Jesus is someone with all the qualities of God. He has everything that makes God, God, and he came to save. We know more of the details than Peter did at this point. We know that Jesus was fully God and fully man. We know he lived a perfect life, was crucified on the cross. His death took all the punishment that we deserve for everything that we have ever done, everything we are doing or everything that we will ever do that separates us from God. Because he was fully God, he could satisfy the requirements of a perfect God. And because he was fully man, he could pay the penalty that mankind owed. But Jesus did more than take the penalty for our sins. He also gives us full credit for the righteousness, the righteous life, the perfect life that he lived. Jesus doesn't just point us to the good news. Jesus is the good news. If you're a follower of Jesus, when you sin, here's what happens. God looks at you. He sees that Jesus paid the penalty. He sees Jesus' perfect righteousness in you, and he says about you, not guilty. And that is true for everything that you do that is wrong. But Jesus does more than that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you to make you more like him every day. Okay, kids, who's this? Okay, I heard a lot of Spider-Man. Are we sure this is Spider-Man? It's... I have no idea who this is. This is some kid dressed up like Spider-Man. Absolutely no idea who this is. If you're in trouble, is this the person you want showing up? No. You want the real Spider-Man. Not that there is a real Spider-Man. Let's be clear. I don't want some kid dressed up like Spider-Man to show up. I want Spider-Man, assuming Spider-Man were real. See, the problem is that the church does the exact same thing with Jesus all the time. They dress up an imposter to look like Jesus. But it's an imposter that cannot save you and cannot transform you. Who do you say that Jesus is? If you believe that Jesus took all the punishment for all your sins, it will grieve you when you sin. You will ask God to help you turn away from your sin, but it will not send you into fear of what God is going to do to you. If you believe that you are given credit for all of Jesus' righteousness, then you will trust that your worst day does not cause God to love you any less, and your best day does not cause God to love you any more. God loves, God's love and acceptance for you has never, ever for one second been based on your performance. It is based on the performance of Jesus. And Jesus lived perfectly and righteously. Do you believe that Jesus is actively at work to give you a new life, to transform you into someone new? If so, then you will join that work and every day seek to become more like Jesus. Jesus doesn't point to the good news. He is the good news. And Jesus is at work. He's at work right now. He is at work building. Specifically, he is building a gospel community. Verses 17 through 20 can be very confusing, and people disagree with how to interpret them. So let's look at them carefully as we walk through them. Jesus tells Peter that he is blessed. To be blessed means to be favored by God, which leads to joy and delight. And the reason that Peter is blessed is because God revealed to him the truth of who Jesus is. This insight was a gift from God. Peter did not figure it out on his own. And if ever there was someone who could have figured out, who could have put the pieces together and said, this is who Jesus is, it would have been Peter. 
Think about what Peter has seen up to this point. Peter saw Jesus heal. He saw Jesus cast out demons. He saw Jesus walk on water. He saw Jesus feed thousands upon thousands of people. Twice. Jesus heard Peter, te- or G- Peter heard Jesus teach. Peter heard Jesus debate with the religious leaders. Couldn't he, Peter of all people, figure out on his own who Jesus was? No. No. The Bible is clear about this. The Bible says that apart from God's work, we are spiritually blind. It is impossible for us to come to Christ on our own. Someone realizing who Jesus is will always, always be a work of God. And there are countless churches and ministries that put on shows or emotionally manipulate or intellectually beat people up in order to get them to come to Christ. And you know what? You can get a lot of people to walk an aisle or say a prayer with those types of tactics. But if God has not eyes of that person, no strategy is going to truly lead someone to Jesus. There's a very, very practical ramification of this. You have a non-Christian in your life. You know what you do? You pray like crazy that God will open their eyes to who Jesus is, just like he did with Peter. Because if Peter couldn't figure it out, it's not going to matter what argument you give, what show you put on, what persuasive or manipulative statements you make. If God does not open their eyes, there will not be a true turning to him. Pray like crazy that God will open their eyes. And then you go make is and what he has done for this person as clear as possible. Verse 18, Jesus promises that on this rock he will build his church and it will withstand the gates of hell. Now the name Peter means rock, so it's undeniable that Jesus is connecting what he is building to Peter in some way and just how that's happening gets debated. But I think the point is simply this. He's not building it on Peter the person. He's building it on the declaration that Peter just made. The gospel, the good news that Jesus is the son of God and the son of God came to save people from their sin. That is what Jesus is building the church on. The gates of hell could refer to a lot of different things. People debate it, but almost everyone comes down to some conclusion like this. It means that not even death And the forces of spiritual evil will overcome the church that Jesus builds. Jesus never promised, not once, that the church that Todd Malone builds, or the church that the elders build, or the church that the deacons build, will prevail. There is no promise That a church of small groups, a church of a certain musical or worship style, a church of missions, a church of any particular program is going to prevail. The only church that will prevail is the church that Jesus builds. That church that Jesus builds is a church that keeps Jesus at the center, not a program, a personality, not a particular preference. Any church that is focused on the church itself and not on Christ, no matter how large, how fast its attendance is growing, how many buildings it has, how large its budget is, that church is in spiritual decay. What does it mean for a church to be centered on Jesus? A church that is centered on Jesus is focused on declaring who God is. Style of music is less important than lyrics that declare the truth about God. You can have a beautiful song that tells you lies about who God is. Every sermon must be intentional about accurately declaring who God is. The goal of the church should never, ever, 
ever be attendance or giving or building. The goal of the church is to see people move from being enemies of God to being people who live out the intention of becoming more like Jesus. Any tradition or program that doesn't do that is not important. Let's give an example that is near and dear to our hearts and is very immediate. Snickers bars are passed out every Father's Day at this church. It is a big tradition around here. Don't worry, they're not going anywhere except maybe my office. Um, But if for some crazy reason, Snickers bars made it more difficult to declare the good news of Jesus and help Christians live out that good news, guess what? Snickers bars are going away. Reese's are in. (laughs) yeah i'm kidding snickers bars are here to stay Um, verse 19 is confusing the keys to the kingdom of heaven refers to the ability to enter god's reign and rule it refers to life with god let me stop here and make a plug we've got a life group that is starting to read the book with that is one of the best books i have ever read in my life it is will challenge you about four ways that churches and individuals tend to think about what it means to be a Christian that are absolutely misleading, but are pervasive in our church. What God calls us to is life with him. Read that book. Um, Join that group if you don't have a group that you're a part of. The key to entering life with God is the gospel. And that is what the church has. The church has the keys to the kingdom because the church has the gospel. The metaphor of binding and loosing was used by rabbis at that time for saying that something was bad, it was bound, or for saying something that was permitted, it's you, it's loosed. In other words, the church has both the right And the responsibility to declare, based on the gospel, what is living like Jesus and what is not living like Jesus. Let me give you an example. Ann and I just got back last night from a two-day mini vacation to Charleston, South Carolina. Our hotel was very close to this church. This is the Emanuel AME Church of Charleston, South Carolina. If you've heard that name before, it's a predominantly African-American church. In fact, the uh, AME denomination, I believe, is the oldest African-American denomination in this country. Four years ago tomorrow, a 21-year-old walked into that church, went to a Bible study, and killed nine people there because he thought killing African-Americans was the right thing to do. You know what? The church built by Jesus has the responsibility to stand up and say, that is wrong. That is not the good news of Jesus in action. When churches do that, they are binding that behavior and saying that is not acceptable. And we should not just do it with incredible tragedies like that. We should do it when Christians gossip. When we hear that Christian, two Christians can't stand each other. Or Christians refuse to pursue unity with each other. We must bind those things and say they do not have a place in the life of someone who's trying to become more like Jesus. Section ends in verse 20. It's a very strange sounding verse because Jesus strongly forbids the disciples from telling anyone that he's the Christ, that he's the one who came to save. And that sounds strange to us, right? We're supposed to tell everyone that Jesus is the Savior. Well, here's what's going on. Remember the people of that time frame expected that Jesus or expected the Messiah would be someone who would come to save them politically. And if they had heard that Messiah, that Christ was here, can you imagine what would happen based on that wrong idea? They would have started a war that they weren't going to win. 
Jesus came to save from separation from God that is caused by sin. He did not come to overthrow the Romans. It matters who you think Jesus is. Because who you think Jesus is affects what church you think he is building. Do you believe that Jesus is a prophet who tells you what you do is wrong, sets an example, and then gets disappointed in you? If that's what your picture of Jesus is, then you know what your picture of your church will be? That it's a church's job to give out rules and make promises and threats based on obedience. You will think that the church's job is to give people lots of church-type things to do so they can prove how much they love God. But if you think that Jesus is the good news and not just someone who points to the good news, then you will think that the church's job is to help people know Jesus intimately. To make the gospel as clear as possible and to pray for the Holy Spirit to work. You will think that the church's goal is to help people become more like Jesus and then unleash followers of Jesus into their neighborhoods, into their schools, into their jobs, and their other daily activities so that people may see firsthand what Jesus is like. Jesus is not someone who points to the good news. Jesus is the good news. And that good news is at work. He is the one who saves us from the penalty and power of sin. And he is the one who right now is building a community based on the gospel. And he's building it right here at FBC. Jesus, and this is the point of the passage and the point of the message. Jesus is building the church. Of the gospel. It is important for us to define the relationship. What is FBC? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to relate to each other? And we're going to explore those things this summer. But we need to start with the fact that the church belongs to Jesus and it is built by Jesus. It is not built on programs, personalities, or preferences. Jesus builds the church on the foundation of the gospel. Any church that is built by anyone other than Jesus and built by anything other than the gospel will not prevail. So how do we respond to this? I'll give you four suggestions. First, again, is to study. We always do the same four types of suggestions. Study, share, pray, practice. Read through this passage again. And I'd encourage verses 17 through 19 and rewrite them in your own words. Again, discuss the questions that are on the handout with someone else. Um, I heard recently that we have a group that after church on Sundays, they get together and they go through the questions. That's a terrific idea. Pray. Ask the Lord to build his church in Longview and ask him what your part is supposed to be. And then play the part by telling one person how Jesus has saved you. Jesus is building his church, and he invites us to come along. And I invite you to stand and pray with me as we close. And as you stand and pray, I'd like the prayer team to come forward. As we say each Sunday, this is a group here that is here to pray with you no matter what you are facing, no matter what your struggle is, no matter what your hopes are, boy, we certainly want to pray with you if you do not know Jesus, who is the Savior. Let us introduce you to him. Would you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love, your goodness, and your grace. Not just for what you have done in the past, but for what you are doing right now. Not just for the fact that you sent your son to save us, but for the fact that your son is at work right now, today, right here, building his church. And Lord, help us never, ever to lose Jesus as the center of our church. Lord, help us to keep him the focus 
of who we are, what we do, and why we do it. And help us to remain a church that Jesus builds and not a church that we build on our own. But Lord, the temptation will always be to put ourselves at the center. Forgive us when we do that and protect us from doing it again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What have we said this morning about who God is? We have said this. Jesus is at work right now, building his church right here. So the question for you as you leave is this. How will you participate in what Jesus is doing? You are dismissed.